For those of you who have been watching my content for the last couple of years, you may be familiar with the name Pulsar Fusion, a company that's been working on a direct fusion space propulsion system that would revolutionize space travel if it ever comes to maturity. But I didn't realize just how much progress this company was actually making. And just a couple of days ago, this company rolled out a new engine called the Sunbird. And to give you an idea as to why this is possible now and doesn't have to wait for fusion power to come to maturity is that it doesn't actually require fusion power. It instead requires the plasma that a fusion reaction creates. And that's something we've been doing in the laboratory for many years now. And by making use of this plasma for exhaust instead of traditional rocket exhaust, you can get some amazing improvement in capability. We're talking 50 15,000 seconds worth of ISP as opposed to only 450 for a conventional rocket engine and the exhaust is traveling 150 kilometers per second as opposed to four and a half kilometers per second for a traditional chemical engine. That's why an engine like this could completely revolutionize the future of spaceflight. And I had the good fortune to come across the CEO of Pulsar Fusion, a man named Richard Dynan, who's been working on this for years. This is his passion. And we got an opportunity to chat at the Spacecom convention in London, England. Good afternoon, folks. We are here at Spacecom with lots of exciting things happening here. As usual, for those of you who've been watching my program for a while, you know about Pulsar Fusion and Richard Dynan. However, for those of you who are new, well, I'm going to introduce you to some fascinating technology today. Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. It's lovely to see you. So, real quick, let's go ahead and start out with the exciting stuff, right? Let's start out with fusion propulsion, because we've been talking about fusion power forever, right? How do we make the jump, or how, how are you planning, rather, to make fusion propulsion possible when fusion power isn't really doable right now? Yeah, it's, it does sound like a crazily ambitious thing, but if we can do fusion on Earth... Um, if we can't, then none of this is, is relevant anyway. If we can do fusion on Earth, then it's much easier to do fusion in space. You've got a lot of things going for you. Um, and without going into too much details, I think the main ones are fusion on Earth, you have to have a massive vacuum chamber, and they have to have all that power. Space, you just open the door, you've got a vacuum. Secondly, fusion reactors were originally linear, um, but the problem is they leaked. In a propulsion system, you don't mind actually having a leak at the end of your rocket if you're using for propulsion. But as a result, instead of having to make it like a toroidal electromagnetic uh, field um, confinement system, um, when you make it a circle, you have another problem, which is bomb diffusion, where all these ions want to go to the edge of the reactor and you have to have massive magnets to try and bring them back in and you've got more confinement issues. And look, we will get over them and fusion will work on Earth, but if you can do it on Earth, you'd be in much better position to do it in space. The scaling problem works in your way. I don't need to breed my own fuels. I don't need to have a... Uh, uh, steam turbine, I don't need to have um, uh, all, all the sort of infrastructure of a power station. So, in short, we, we feel that it's a much more uh, near-term commercial prospect than actually building massive terrestrial fusion reactors. All right, so real quick, once again, I want to go ahead and, and give the viewers a bit of a review of what differentiates what you're talking about from fusion power. The idea behind it, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, is to create plasma. You don't have to get net power out of this arrangement, but rather creating plasma in a microgravity vacuum environment and using the plasma, ionized high energy plasma, to produce your thrust, or is it different than that? A little different. So, uh, you know, iron engines are using a relatively low temperature plasma, like a Hall effect thruster, which looks a bit like fusion. Um, and it is, it's a plasma under electromagnetic confinement, but it's using, it's the, actually the electrostatic um, force and the Hall effect current that is giving you an iron propulsion, and actually it's not a very strong one, um, but it's good for deorbiting, station keeping, reorbiting, things like that. And they're, they're getting quite powerful, but they're, they're nothing like a combustion rocket. Fusion is an entirely different thing. Obviously, you're actually using a nuclear reaction. Uh, in deutrium deuterium, you're creating an alpha particle and um, a neutron. 
neutrons great on Earth because they, you know, they fire into the walls of your reactor and they um, create heat and we know what to do with heat. Um, you, know, you can build a steam turbine around it. Um, problem is that they will ultimately eat that reactor. And in space, I don't want a very heavy neutron source spraying neutrons all over my spacecraft and ultimately degrading it because if I'm spending all that money to put it in orbit, I don't want somebody, I don't want to have to take it down and service it and take it apart. I also don't want to have a steam turbine. So, it, so I don't understand why you would want a tokamak in space. Um, but if you can use aneutronic fuel pairs like deuterium and helium-3, wouldn't do it on Earth because it's expensive, but again, if I can save you time and space, you will pay for the helium-3. Then actually, instead of creating a neutron, I'm creating an alpha I'm creating a, um, a proton as my, I guess, that is the output from the reaction. And that, that also carries a great deal of energy. I mean, it dwarfs in terms of particle speeds anything you get from electrostatic or, or magnetic field. So, um, well, the acceleration you'll get from magnetic field and that's, I guess, that sort of um, thrust. So if, for, for propulsion in space, the king of power of propulsion is, uh, is fusion. Um, so we know that's where we want to be. Nuclear fission is actually also a very, very good um, power source for propulsion. And you can also use nuclear heat to, to create very good high-speed gases, but nothing on the level in terms of speed uh, as fusion. And space is a massive place. So if you want to go enormous distances, then everything is about speed. Um, so let's go ahead and jump over to something brand new that your company announced fairly recently, and that is the Sunbird. Let's go ahead and talk about what, for what sort of propulsion does it use? How is it different from other types of nuclear engines that are being proposed? And what can it do? The Sunbird. Um, so Pulsar at the moment spends most of its time testing large iron thrusters in vacuum chambers. And these iron thrusters have got to be on pendulums. So it's really hard. Uh, and their pendulums are, laser, you know, you have laser measurements to work out your thrust. And the chambers are the size of a double-decker bus. And we have two of them. You must come and see them. It's really, really hard. So I'm not naive to the challenges of this. I know how hard fusion propulsion sounds and is. But the Sunbird project is something that Pulsar feels is our, our moonshot mission of where we feel fusion and how we feel it should be used in space. Um, because there are ways it wouldn't be used, and we think the Sunbird concept is the way that fusion should and will be used, if we can use fusion in space at all. Um, and in short, rather than launching with a reactor, the Sunbirds will be in orbit, and you just have to get your rocket to low Earth orbit, and at that point, the Sunbird can navigate its way to you, and then, so you've saved the weight and the delta V of launching with a propulsion source, and then it can obviously use, you can utilize the exhaust speed potential, cutting your fuel, cutting your weight, cutting your expenditure, making it a green emission altogether. And then um, once you reach your mission, we'll have another perch. So we might have a station at Mars with several other sunbirds. It's effectively, it's like a reverse field confinement linear fusion reactor, but there are two of them uh, in a formation which gives us actually advantages in the simulation models. Um, but also most of the, again, some of the work we do all the time with our missions at Pulsar is reducing risk. Very rarely do you have one engine system because of the probability models of failure and things like that. So these are two engines which actually gives you, as I said, advantages in the simulation, but also um, uh, you've got effectively, so two linear reactors, a tank, and a lot of radiation shielding um, to protect you from, if these things are doing multiple missions, they're gonna have a lot of radiation and you know, especially deeper space missions. And actually, it did look a bit like a bird when we put it together and we saw this radioactive block with these reactors and it's powered by the same technology as the sun so it became the sunbird and it sits on a perch um, and that's why the sunbird came to its name. That's fantastic. So once again, um, and you viewers are watching this right now, the idea behind this concept is to have, you've got your radiation shielding included with the engine in space, you've got your propellant up in space, you've got your fuel, your reactor, so you don't have to take any of these things up with you. All of these things, especially the, the fact that you have the propellant and the shielding there on the engine, so you don't have to carry that to low Earth orbit, that just, that's a huge amount of 
efficiency there. Where are you going to get the propellant? Do you have an idea of maybe getting helium-3 from the moon, that sort of thing, or, or elsewhere? You're, you're right. Um, the moon surface, the lunar regolith, is, is very rich with helium-3, um, but we aren't planning on mining the moon. Um, only for the reason that the right system for us is we need a couple of grams of this um, for, 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 for to sort of set these engines on. So you need, um, the best thing for us would be to breed it. And it is expensive to breed it, um, but it's worth it. If it maybe as an energy source on Earth, it's less efficient and it would again cause problems. But because the bar is lower in orbit, I can, you can lose money and it's still a successful mission if I've saved you time. Um, so it's a different uh, goalpost to Fusion on Earth and a lower bar and scaling works in your favor as long as some of the other principles I told you. So that's why, um, actually, where does fusion happen in space? Doing it on Earth is a very unnatural thing to do. Um, so um, we breed it is the answer to your question. Fantastic. So the other thing that we're going to talk about, we're going to have a look at right now, is what I admire about your company is the idea that, yes, you have these amazing dreams of fusion propulsion, interplanetary travel, that sort of thing. But right now, you're putting money in your coffers with ion engines, with engines you're selling to, to customers right now as we speak. So I'd like to go and have a look at these engines. That sound good Ooh. to you? Great. All right, Richard, let's go and have a look at all these engines. All right, I'm very excited to see them. Great. So these are Hall Effect thrusters for use on satellites. These are actually quite large for um, conventional electric propulsion on satellites. Um, these engines are actually being displayed by a client over there as well. And you'd need enormous solar pa panels to power them. Um, but this is a 500 watt Hall Effect thruster. And the whole system looks a little bit like this. So you've got your thruster head, power supply, gas supply, propellant management system, and it's kind of, we build them in a very modular way at Pulsar, rather than having to redesign a satellite every time. We want to make it like Lego, so that we can save non-recurring engineering fees. Um, because again, it wastes time, it creates more risk. Um, and so this is basically some of our uh, configuration, some of those engines. The future, however, may not rely so heavily on solar, and we might go to nuclear electric propulsion, and this is our Moon Ranger engine. Uh, this is our five kilowatt state-of-the-art um, five kilowatt Hall effect thruster with a center cathode. So um, it actually, uh, that's actually quite, I think it's the kind of the sweet spot at where you can be without needing nu uh, nuclear fission power su source to supply it. Now, the U did the UK Space Agency give you some money to develop this? I seem to recall that you had a large engine of some kind that you had gotten some funding for. Yeah, the UK Space Agency did fund us to build an actually even bigger engine than this, a 10 kilowatt, which is actually over there. We, we, uh, the reason that that engine isn't so commercial is because most satellite manufacturers don't have the power supply for something that big yet. So it's a tomorrow engine. Um, unless you've got, again, nuclear reactor to power it. But we have, we have got them over there, and I think, you know, the biggest problem is the further you go out into space, the more that the sort of solar intensity fades away, and um, deep space missions are going to need more power source, a bigger power source. So anyway, those are our bigger engines on display today. And, they, you know, we are already selling these engines at the moment, so they're commercial, um, and they're funding the business, uh, and ultimately powering one day our moonshot. Fantastic. Well... Richard, this is amazing. I'm really looking forward to seeing what's happening next with you folks. So I think you said that you're okay with me dropping by to see your vacuum you chambers. Love You'd love to see that. And you're going to be doing some plasma tests soon with those chambers, right? Absolutely. Uh, right now, they're just getting the cryogenics installed. We're going to do initial pump downs. And these are the size of a double-decker bus. They are the biggest in, in the UK, and we have two of them. And they are likely the biggest commercial ones in Europe. Um, but, you know, that's not meant to be a boast. It's a shame. There should be a lot more chambers this size for testing everything in this hall. If you want to put it in space, you need to test it in a vacuum, and therefore you need a big vacuum chamber. So come and see them. Come and uh, kick the tires. Make sure that we're saying um, whatever what we're saying is what we're doing. And uh, that's what we appreciate about you. Once again, let me emphasize, folks, we're talking about the biggest vacuum chambers in Britain being used to test plasma systems for interplanetary fusion propulsion. That's happening right here in the UK. Stay tuned. Don't miss it. Thanks again Thank for your time. Jordan. Thank you. 
And once again, folks, if you like this kind of content, well, I can't get to these conferences without your generous support. So please check the description for various ways to support this content on Patreon, on PayPal, buy some merch, something along those lines so I can keep bringing this content to you. And until next time, stay angry about space.